Um, so if you want to find out more about the work of the Institute of Advanced Studies and how to get involved, uh, please go to our website, which is elbra.ac.uk slash research slash IAS. So we're running this as a hybrid event, which means we have a few people with us here in the room at International House and others of you have joined us online. So thank you very much for coming. This Zoom webinar format does automatically turn off your audio and video. Sorry about that. Um, but you can still post comments in the chat and feel free to do that. Um, and you can use the Q&A function as well. Um, if you use the Q&A function rather than the chat to post any questions, um, then they'll all be in the same place. Um, and that will be easy for us. Um, and we'll try and pick up those questions at the end of Priscilla's lecture. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Sarah Lombardo, who is Associate Dean for Teaching and Professor of Mathematics. Um, and I'll ask her to introduce our Newton International Fellow and the work she's doing while she's with us. Sarah. Yes, thank you very much, Katie, and welcome uh, everyone. So it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, um, Priscilla Leal da Silva this afternoon. So Priscilla is a Brazilian mathematician and her research focuses on the mathematical properties of partial differential equations. She started off studying um, science and technology and graduated in 2011. And then she realized that she had a real passion for mathematics. So she went on studying maths in, and graduated in 2013. She then continued with a PhD in mathematics, um, uh, graduating in 2016, and her thesis uh, focused uh, on uh, um, the um, solutions, uh, well, properties of solutions uh, of integrable systems. Um, Priscilla and I um, met uh, in the virtual world a few years ago. Um, uh, for the mathematicians among the audience, uh, in the UK has a real strength uh, around uh, the integrable system. So, so there are large communities, uh, very strong uh, uh, worldwide, and Loughborough is uh, one of the largest group, uh, so hosts one of the largest group in, in the field. So, so we started um, discussing potential uh, um, collaborations, uh, topics of research, our our interests uh, are somehow complementary. Um, I look much more to the algebraic and geometrical side. Priscilla comes with a more analytical or from analysis, uh, say, into integrability. In fact, uh, she, during her postdoc, she um, looked also at the uniqueness and existence uh, of, of solutions. So, so we felt that there was a great scope for collaboration. And so, it was a pleasure to support Priscilla applying. Uh, um, she applied twice, uh, the first time unsuccessfully and uh, successfully in 2020. So that was uh, resilience pays off uh, and perseverance. Uh, so again, something to think about. Um, and, and here it is today after a start delayed by the pandemic, uh, the project should have been starting in uh, March. And it could only start in, in September. Um, so today she will talk about herself a little bit uh, and obviously on uh, her research. She has been asked to prepare a talk for a, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary audience. Um, uh, but I also would like to tell you that she will give a more specialist talk uh, um, next Wednesday, um, the 9th of February, in the Mathematical Sciences Department. Um, so I can pass the floor to Priscilla. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sara, for the kind words and for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Institute of Advanced Studies for the kind invitation to present uh, my research here. My special thank you to Katie, Kiran, and Marsha for all the support through these troubled times because it's been a long journey to get here. So um, I am a Newton International Fellow in a fellowship that is granted by the Royal Society. I work here at Loughborough University, working with Professor Sada Lombardo, 
in the Department of Mathematical Sciences. I'm also a lecturer in Brazil in a very young university called a Federal University of ABC, which is located in the state of Sao Paulo. Um, before we start with a more, um, a more precise definition of what we intend on doing with our talk, I don't think it's shared, right? Okay, let me share the talk here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so before uh, we start with um, the, our research topics and what we are doing here, I want to briefly introduce myself and my both my academic tra trajectory and also my research interests, those, the, the research that I previously um, did that led me here. So uh, in 2016, I finished my PhD in mathematics at Federal University of C. And here we have a curiosity already that um, our PhD program is very young and started in September, 2014. And I was among the five first students to start the PhD. And my thesis was the first mathematics to be uh, defended in the university. So here we have a curiosity about that. So after I finished my PhD, I moved to another university in Brazil, still in the state of Sao Paulo, which is called Federal University of São Carlos. And there I worked as a research associate in 2017 and 2018. And after these two years, I returned to Federal University of ABC as a lecturer, hired as a lecturer, uh, and I am a lecturer there uh, to today. In 2020, we were uh, successful with our application for a new international fellowship granted by the Royal Society. And um, we started in September 2021 after some, some, some problems that happened to everybody in the world. Here, I, I also have this curiosity that, um, as Sara mentioned, uh, uh, the, our second attempt was successful, but this was in fact my fourth attempt for this, this fellowship. So I guess that four here is my lucky number. Let's move on now to my research interests. And here I wanna comment a little bit about my, what, I, what I work with and what I have been doing in, in, in all those years. So I start here with the first topic, which is integrable equations, which is something that we're gonna talk um, about uh, later in this talk, because this topic is very relevant for what we do, what we intend on doing. Uh, and we can think of integrable equations as a very important concept in mathematics and physics, because we have uh, many properties and many applications that we even deal with it in basic courses, such as classical mechanics. Um, to mention uh, um, as an example of work that I, that I did, uh, with this object that we call integrable equations. We have this paper that was published in 2020 in studies in plant mathematics, in which we dealt with this object that's called uh, the, the, the generalization of this so-called kamas home equation. And among our results, we dealt with some open questions regarding the integrability of this object. And our results in this paper uh, suggest that this equation that we were studying is not integrable and, sol and solves and answers some questions that were raised by previous papers. Another topic of interest is a study of classical and weak solutions of partial differential equations. Here by classical solution, I mean a solution for an equation that is, has as many degrees of differentiability as we want. So for example, if we're working with a third order differential equation, I want my solution to be three times continuously differentiable. On the other hand, if I'm talking about weak solutions, I'm talking about special solutions that lose this differentiability at a certain point and um, need to be dealt with in different ways in what now, a way that um, I, I like to pursue this, I tackle this problem, is what we call the theory of distributions. Here in this paper, uh, published in 2019, in Journal of Mathematical Analysis and Applications, I studied this other object, it's called the Gottfeld-Holm equation, which, by the way, is an integrable equation. And I'm able to 
perform a classification for wave solutions of this equation. And in the results, we can say exactly what types of classical solutions and the types of weak solutions that will exist for this equation. Finally, um, I also want to mention here the qualitative analysis of solutions. And by qualitative analysis of the solutions here, I mean that I study properties of these solutions without having uh, to know exactly the shape of the solution. We don't have to know explicitly what the solution looks like in order to understand how it behaves. So um, as an example, I mentioned this paper here, um, published in 2019, which unfortunately I cannot pronounce the name of the paper. I apologize for that, uh, in which we dealt with another object and we were able to, without knowing exactly what the solution looks like, we were able to show that the solution exists with an initial data in a certain space. And moreover, we were able to show that the solution belongs, is unique and belongs to a certain, a particular and very special uh, class of, of, of functions um, that uh, in this paper, we were able, we would dealt with this, this type of, of, of spaces. Um, okay, so let's move on. Okay, um, first of all, um, I would like to mention that I'm a mathematician, so I work here. The topic for my, my research is about mathematics. However, I prepared this talk to be um, wider in a sense because our audience is, is composed by, by members that has diverse uh, interests. So I'm going to try to be the less technical that I can. I'm going to try to avoid jargons and I'm going to try to present basically everything that we deal with mathematically, but for a more intuitive way. So I want to start here with the concept of stability um, in things that we see in the world and why it is important. Why do we need to, st to study stability um, if to deal with problems in our world. So I want to start with um, this article that is found in the United States Geological Survey website, in which they talk about this mega tsunami hypothesis and why it was highly unlikely for it to happen. Okay, so what is this mega tsunami hypothesis and where is it based um, um, from? So we have this paper published in 2001, in which um, the authors um, suggested that a collapse of this volcano that we have in La Palma, which is called Cumbre Vieja, and that the, the eruption of this volcano could lead to tsunami waves that would go up to 25 meters high along the east coast of North and South America. And I remember before coming to the UK, I remember talking to my husband about that back in Brazil because the east coast of, of South America is the east coast of Brazil. So we remember, uh, we were talking about this because this was on the news and this was something that was relevant. And this article is basically saying that, okay, this hypothesis that's raised by this paper is not exactly, it's not highly, uh, it's highly unlikely to happen. So basically what they say is that um, this paper assumed a single coherent massive collapse block that would hit the ocean and cause the tsunami to appear. However, geomorphologists found using stability analysis that the block that would hit the ocean was much smaller than the one simulated by the paper. Okay? They go on saying that um, these volcanoes, they erupt regularly, but the stability analysis conducted at this volcano, this particular volcano, uh, indicate that the structure is stable. It finalizes basically saying that, okay, this particular structure is stable. This is unlikely to happen, but we have problems when volcanoes erupt and the, the eruption of volcanoes could actually lead to tsunamis as they give this example in 2018 that um, resulted in hundreds of people killed. So what do we mean here by stability? Because we have the word stability coming, we have stable and everything that comes with the word stability or, or any variant of this, the, this, this word. So basically what, what it's saying here is that, okay, so you have the volcano, the volcano is throwing a block into the ocean. So this block is perturbing the ocean 
And the hypothesis was this perturbation is so significant that this would lead to an instability in the ocean to cause it to tsunami. But what they are doing here is basically saying that the block is hitting the ocean, but the change in the ocean is not significant. So the, the, after the perturbation, the ocean can go back to its original state. So this is what we're calling stability. So in this case, the volcano is a stable. We have many examples of stability happening in nature. So I want to give some examples uh, some that you're probably familiar with. So let's start with turbulence in airplanes. Unfortunately, most of us who have been in a, in a, in a plane before uh, has had to deal with um, a plane shaking, right? So turbulence caused by external factors such as wind, such as rain, such as lightning, anyway, many other um, uh, effects that can, can, can happen. And we want it to go as soon as possible, to go away as soon as possible. So we want the turbulence to end so the plane can continue without much worry. But in some cases, when this turbulence happens, the pilot may kind of lose control of the plane and may have to be forced to do something about it, such as uh, forcing a landing or changing the routes in order to recover and be safe and avoid a possible disaster. Um, and this here we, here we have the concept of stability. So when you have the plane and you have an external perturbation, let's say for example rain, and the pilot loses control of the plane, we are basically saying that the plane becomes unstable. So the plane becomes unstable and then this instability can lead the pilot to take some action about this instability, but we all want the plane to be stable. So here we have already the importance of studying stability, such as to predict and prevent disasters in real world. Um, and we also see another point that although we like things to be stable, we want the plane to be stable, we also want to understand it's instabilities. Instabilities may be as important or even more important than studying stability because um, we wanted to be able to prevent disasters. In this case, the pilot can act on, on the instability of the plane. Another example, and here we go back, back to the case of volcanoes, is that volcanoes have their structures usually at rest. So volcanoes doesn't, the volcanoes don't erupt at all, all the time. So let's consider that its original state is being at rest. And let's assume that we have two tectonic plates that are close enough to this volcano. And after they collide, this will cause a perturbation in the, the volcano that can lead to an instability in the volcano and cause this volcano to erupt. So here we have the eruption of the volcano coming as a result of instability after this perturbation of the tectonic plates. Still talking about tectonic plates, they can be in the ocean. And when they collide in the ocean, this will perturb the ocean and may cause instability in the ocean resulting in a tsunami, okay? So here, it's funny because in the volcano case, in the, 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 the mega tsunami hypothesis, we talked about a volcano perturbing the ocean. Well, but here we can also have a tectonic plate perturbing the ocean and leading to an instability in the ocean. Finally, I want to talk a very specific type of, uh, of, of events that occurs in the ocean, which is called Hogue wave, the, the, the occurrence of Hogue waves. Hogue waves um, are anomalous waves that appear basically from nothing in, in the world, in the, the ocean. And um, there is a heated debate about where they come from, what are the reasons why they appear. And one of the possible explanations here is instability. So it's a result of an instability in the ocean, a particular instability in the ocean. And why, why it's important to understand the, the, these instabilities and the, the occurrence of these waves? Because these waves can hit boats. These waves can hit offshore structures that we have in the ocean, or your platforms. And when we study these instabilities and we know if a certain place is prone to having this type of instability, this type, this type of phenomena occurring, we can, um, for example, avoid to take a ship through that direction 
or we can see how those waves will damage a certain structure in an oil platform and things like that. And again, here, I stress that uh, the study of stabilities is very important, but more, more importantly is the study of instabilities because we can help our world by predicting and preventing those, the disasters that can come from, from them. So what is the objective of our, of our, of our project here? We want to study stability in, in what we call integrable equations. Of course, here, again, we want to uh, put the word stability here, but we are more interested in the onset of instabilities. But how can we define the concept of stability? How can we use words to describe what we have just seen in the examples? So here we have, after being externally perturbed, Stability is the ability of an object to return to its original state. Okay, so um, back to the plane example, the perturbation coming from wind is causing, a, is causing this perturbation in the plane, but we want it to be stable so not much will happen. It won't be significant enough for the pilot to lose control. So we have the structure to be stable. Okay, this, the concept of integrable equations is more mathematical. Okay. It has its applications, it's very important, has very important applications, uh, but it's more mathematical and we will give a definition of it uh, a little later. But how can we see it here? So inter integrable equations are nonlinear equations arising as compatibility conditions of certain linear equations. Okay, so we need to talk about the mathematics. Okay, so I'm going to try to be more intuitive about um, what, uh, what we are doing and why we need mathematics in our world um, to study, in particular here, uh, stability. So mathematically speaking, the description of natural processes that evolve through time and space are represented by solutions of partial differential equations. And here by partial differential equations, I mean equations that involve derivatives, so that's why they are differential, and the functions involved in this equations depend more on more than one variable. Okay, so for example here, I mentioned the linear Schrodinger equation, which is given by this expression that we have here. Okay, we have a derivative of u with respect to time, we have two derivatives of u with respect to x, and u is a function of time t and space x, and x is a real number, we're going to take it as a real number, and, and t being the time we are um, uh, taking it as a positive number. Okay, we here we have this constant that, that this weird H that appears here that refers to the Planck constant defined in the, in the context of quantum mechanics, and M is the mass of the particle under consideration because this equation um, describes the motion of a free particle of mass M in quantum mechanics. So um, by free particle here, I basically mean that there is no external force acting on this particle, so it's free, free of the action of, of forces, okay? This is a linear equation. This is a second order linear equation, okay? And unfortunately, our world is very nonlinear, and this is a problem because um, linear equations are reasonably easier to solve when compared to nonlinear equations. Okay, it's not something easy. Solving partial differential equations is not something that is easy in general, but solving linear equations are, uh, this is something that is somewhat easier than solving nonlinear. And then if the world is nonlinear, then well, we have the problems of finding solutions for, for these equations. So for example, in line with the linear um, Schrodinger equation, we have the, the call, so-called nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is given by this equation here that we have. Um, the structure is not much different in terms of the linear terms. So we have a, a first derivative with respect to time t, second derivative with respect to x. So basically we recover the same, the same, um, the same linear structure that the linear case. Here we have this, this constant that we can change variables in order to remove it. So the structure is basically the same. But the main problem here is that we are adding this nonlinear term that's on this the expression involving s, where s is a parameter here that we're going to choose as plus one or minus one. And this is a very important uh, equation because it has applications in, study, in the study of physics, such as fiber optics, Bose-Einstein condensates, and even a more applied 
um, the context, context of, of shallow water waves. Okay, this is a nonlinear equation. So as I mentioned, much more difficult to solve than the previous one, but it's possible to find solutions and fairly simple solutions because this equation is very well known and very well studied. So we can find examples of simple solutions and examples of, of graphical examples of how the solutions behave. So for example, here, as an example of, of, a, of, a, simple, of a simple solution for this equation, we have this function u, which is given in terms of this exponential that depends on the parameter s as we choose in the equation. And this solution is called plane wave solution. Okay, another important um, property for, for this equation is that this, this equation, it is a prototype for certain types of instability. So, well, we are trying to deal with, with its instability. So this equation is very important for us here. Here we have a graphical example of a solution and a very special solution for this equation, which is called the peregrine soliton. And here we have a 3D um, view of how it behaves. Of course, here we are dealing with the square of the function. We are not dealing with the function itself. And here we define the, the equation in terms of u. Here it's given in terms of psi, but we have the temporal and spatial um, uh, variation of, of, this, of this solution. Okay, so we went from linear equation to nonlinear equation, which is fine. This equation has very good applications. But if we allow this equation, which is a scalar case because we have one equation with one function here, if we allow this equation from scalar to a matrix case or a vector case, that is a system of differential equations, equations involving with more than one, systems involving more than one equation, we can capture our world a little better because we have more degrees of freedom. We have more variables to be able to describe what we have here. So um, when we go from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and we go to the vector case of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is also known as the Menikoff system. And here we have the expression for the system that, for this, this system, which is basically the same, has the same type of structure as the as the as the the scalar case is basically the same thing. So we have the same linear form here for the equation, and we have also parameters s1, s2. Of course, here we are going from one function to two, u1, u2. This is uh, an example of of what can capture a world better. And this equation is physically relevant because it describes optical solitons and collective states in low low temperature physics. Okay, it's important to mention here that uh, two things, basically. When we go from nonlinear to systems, we are capturing the world better. So for example, resonance processes that occur in a world cannot be captured by scalar equations. It can only be captured by systems. And the other thing that, that I would like to mention is similarly when that uh, from where we go from linear to nonlinear, equations and it becomes much more difficult to solve the equation. When we go from scalar, when we go from equation to system, it becomes even more difficult to find solutions for the systems. However, in a similar way to the scalar case, we can find fairly simple solutions um, for, for the system, which is given by functions u1 and u2, as we have here. Uh, given in terms of uh, uh, the exponential, where q and u are functions, are sorry, are constants that are determined in terms of the constitutive parameters of the system. And this is also called a plane wave solution for the system. We have here an example of a solution composed of functions u1 and u2, and here we're looking at the absolute value of them. Right? And this solution, this example was found and this paper uh, published in 2013. Okay, so now we have the background. Now we have, uh, we know why mathematics is important and we're, because we're trying to use differential equations to describe our world, the phenomena that, 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 that happen in the world. And now we need to define this mathematically for us to study this in a more mathematical way. So let's start with the stability. And I define the stability using words in the following way. After being externally perturbed, stability is the ability of an object to return to its original state.
But how do we do that uh, mathematically? How do we define mathematically the concept of stability? So, okay, let's consider a certain equation, the equation that is of our interest to study. And this equation will be written in terms of a function u. So what we're gonna do is to perturb the solution by a perturbation that we're gonna call delta u, and we can proceed to define stability. So basically what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the perturbed equation, the perturbed solution, u plus delta u. We're gonna plug it into the solution. We're gonna uh, obtain a, a, an equation for the perturbation. So we're gonna look at only the linear stage for now, which means that we're gonna look at the equation after substitution and neglect everything that is non-linear. So we'll have this linear equation on the perturbation delta u. Well, based on this linearized equation, we can define stability as um, the solution will be stable if this perturbation at a linear stage, looking only at the linear, uh, the, the linearization for the perturbation is bounded. What the, what the, the problems here is that uh, although we linearize the equation and we are supposedly, we supposedly find a, more, a simpler solution, a super simpler equation to deal with, it's not exactly easy to solve. And it can, became, it can become very complicated and leading to us only being able to deal with this equation numerically. So we will use numerical methods to solve it. But we wanna to try to understand this analytically. And that's our approach here. We're gonna go look at integrable equations to try to solve, uh, to, to try to, to not solve the equation, but, but try to go for a more qualitative approach to prove that the solution is the, the solution for the perturbation is bounded or not. So we wanna look at qualitatively, but analytically as well in order to uh, solve our problem uh, without having to use numerical methods here. What is an integrable equation? Okay, and here um, I give one of the possible definitions. There are many um, the definitions for integrability, but here I mentioned the one that we're gonna use. Uh, an equation, and here by equation, I mean nonlinear. So from now on, I'm only talking about nonlinear equations. And this equation is said to be integrable. If we can find a pair of matrices x and t, and these matrices depend on space x, time t, and on a spectral parameter lambda, such that the equation will arise as a compatibility condition. And here a compatibility condition is given by the expression xt minus tx plus the commutator of these two matrices equals zero. And this will be the compatibility condition from, from the uh, arising from the two linear equations that we have here, okay? So um, intuitively, how can we understand integrable equations? We can look at a nonlinear integrable equation as the most linear that a nonlinear equation can be. Why? Because this nonlinear equation is being related to a linear problem uh, by making use of a compatibility condition. It arises a compatibility condition of two linear uh, equations. So when we have the, the equation is integrable in the sense, we're gonna call x and t a lax pair. We have this definition that is given in terms of matrices and it is sufficient for, for, for what we wanna do with stability. But I have to mention here, because it will be equally important that we have an equivalent form of writing the lax pair. So here in the first line, we have the equation written, the, 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 the system written in terms of matrices X and T, and we have an equivalent way in which we're gonna, um, we're gonna substitute, we're gonna replace the matrices by operators L and B. So let's start with the one on the right. So we go from matrix T to operator B, but the structure here for, for the, 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 the two equations are basically the same in the sense that the shape is not looking. So we have derivative in T in both equals something that's applied to a function. So not much is changing here. However, when we look at the, the one on the left, the spatial part for the last pair, we have that we're going from a linear system, linear equation that is going, that's taking a matrix T and we are transforming this in an eigenvalue problem that re that's referring to the spectrum L the spectrum of L, the eigenvalues lambda of this, the, the, the operator L. 
So these two equations are equivalent, but differently than the ones on the right, much is changing here. And I mentioned this because the problem of finding the eigenvalues for this operator L is very classical in mathematics. This is something that is very well studied and very important for mathematics. So um, we have this equivalence between these two formulations in the spatial part of the Lax pair. Of course, we are changing from matrices to, to, to operators. We are also expecting the compatibility condition to change. And that's what we have. We have an equivalence between uh, the condition we, for which we define the Lax pair and this other um, condition that's given in terms of the operators L and B. When we look at the spatial part for this, this the, the Lax pair, and especially we're looking at the, 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 the equation coming for, for, for L, we can define the spectrum of L as a set of complex lambda, such that the solution for this equation is bounded. This object is something that we're gonna need later on because our preliminary results involve this, this set. Regarding integral equations, uh, the two basically, the two examples that I gave here, which the first one is this scalar nonlinear Fermier equation, is an integrable equation. And we can construct those matrices X and T that are given in terms of the parameter S written in the equation, the spectral parameter lambda, and the solution U, right? Both matrices are, are defined that way. And as we take those, those matrices and plug into the compatibility condition, what happens is that we will obtain just the equation, right? So the equation is arising as um, at the compatibility condition for this, this, this two matrices here. For the, the, the vector case, as we go to the vector uh, nonlinear Fermi equation, we also have that this equation is integrable and we can construct um, the matrices X and T given by these two formulas, where here we opt to write um, simpler matrices uh, sigma and Q. Um, Q is, is, is written also in terms of the, the solution of the, the, the system. And as we take these this matrices and we plug them into X and T in substitute into the, the compatibility condition, we will also obtain um, the system as a result of this condition. Here, I would like to mention that in the scalar case, those matrices are two by two. Okay. And as we move to the vector case, these matrices are not two by two, they are three by three. And this is something that's going to be, uh, it's a detail that's going to be very important for us here. Now that we have everything defined, what are the goals for our project? What are we studying and what do we intend to do in the next couple of years? Before we talk about the goals, we need to um, talk about this paper that was published in 2018, in which the authors, they define this mathematical object that's called the stability spectra. Basically what we do is to look at the matrix formulation for the Lux pair, and we're gonna be able to construct sets SX and ST based on the solution of the solution Psi of this Lux pair. Okay, basically what we're gonna have, we're gonna have a solution that will involve a couple of matrices and we're gonna look at the eigenvalues of these matrices uh, to define the sets, okay? When we have the sets and we are able to then relate them, we completely characterize stability. But more importantly, something that is our interest, we are able to describe the onset of instabilities. So based on this object that's called stability spectra that was recently defined, what is our object here? What, what, what do we want to work with? We want to take these objects and study and characterize them. Okay, so we want to know what are the topological and algebraic properties of these objects. Moreover, since we are perturbing the solution and looking at, um, at, at the perturbation, we want to understand how this spectrum depend on the perturbations. And I like to, to stress here that um, we are looking at a linear stage, right? So if we understand how the spectrum depends on perturbations at a linear stage, we can then move towards a nonlinear stage. Instead of neglecting what's nonlinear, we're going to start looking at the nonlinear parts of our, of our uh, perturbation. So this, this leads 
to the next bullet point here, which is to study the nonlinear stages of instabilities. And this is a very challenging problem because very little is known. There, we have some results for the scalar nonlinear equation, the scalar nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but very little is known for uh, equations in general, even integrable equations. So we want to try to uh, understand a little more what happens with the nonlinear stages here. Okay, so since we're looking at integrable equations, another thing is that uh, we want to understand the boundaries that are set by these integrable equations, because integrable equations have many properties and many useful properties. So we can basically pinpoint what we, we, we want to use and try to extract information. Okay, these are the ones that are basically relevant. So is it possible that we can go beyond integrable equations and look for something that may be non-integrable, non but have these properties and how can we use them? So this is something that we also want to understand. Okay, um, regarding our preliminary results, because we have, we have been studying especially the first part of our goals. So we have um, uh, some interesting results already. Okay, when we define this object that's called stability spectrum, we have the equivalence for the Lux pair. And the question here is, is the stability spectrum as X equals the spectrum of L? Where does this question come from? So let's think about um, the Lux pair here. In the first line, we again have the matrix formulation. Uh, in the second line, we have the equivalent uh, form written in terms of operators. So as we mentioned, the one on the right is not changing much. The, this space, it looks the same. But the second one, we're going from a linear problem to a spectral problem here for the operator L. And we are defining this object as X that completely defines the stability, but we also have this object uh, for, the, for the one uh, on the bottom that we have the spectrum. So how do, how do, do they relate? How can we relate as X to L, okay? So, um, Basically, the question that comes from is summarized here. So we have the equivalence between these two equations. So in a way, can we say that they are the same? And the answer is false. Those two sets are not the same. In fact, um, the stability spectrum does not need to be equal to the spectrum of L. And where does this question come from in terms of applications? Because when we look at the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the scalar case, when we calculate the spectrum of the operator L and the stability spectrum as X, this basically, we're doing the same thing. We're retaining the same sets, so these sets are equal. However, we have proved that when we move for the vector case of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the spectrum of L is not the same set as SX. In fact, what we have is that the spectrum of L contains only the real part of the stability spectrum. So here we are, we are losing the imaginary axis here. Okay? It's important here to mention that for the scalar case, the matrices uh, are two by two, as I mentioned previously. And this is basically what is making um, the spectrum of L be equals S X. While for the vector case, the matrices are three by three. So when we move from two to three, we are having this different. So our conjecture here is that in higher matrix dimensions, um, the spectrum of the operator L is not going to be the same as the stability spectrum as X. And we want to prove, in fact, that they are related by showing that the spectrum of L is a subset of the stability spectrum in the real axis. This is something that we want to prove. And if this conjecture turns out to be true, as a consequence here is that the calculating the spectrum of L is not sufficient to characterize stability. So we need to look at uh, the stability spectrum and we do not, we cannot just stay with um, the spectrum of the operator L. So this is what we have so far. This is something that we are still working with, especially to prove this conjecture and um, even try to make other conjectures uh, for these objects. Uh, but this is what we have so far. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.